Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. Today we're talking to Joanna Penn. Joanna is an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of Thrillers under J.F. Penn. And Joanna also writes non-fiction for authors. She's an award-winning creative entrepreneur, a podcaster and a YouTuber. Her site, thecreativepen.com, has been voted in the top 100 sites for writers by Writer's Digest. I can't wait to hear more. Welcome, Joanna, to the podcast. Thanks so much for coming on to our show today. Oh, I'm really excited to talk to you, ladies. Thanks for having me on. Well, if we kick off with the first question, we want to know how your writing adventure began and when you really knew that you wanted to be an author. Right. Well, I think, you know, maybe like many readers listening, um, I was always a reader, right, from, you know, very, very young. And I didn't really think that being a writer was something possible. (laughs) I mean, I really didn't. (laughs) Um, And then uh, I got to sort of 30, you know, hit 30 early midlife crisis going, what am I doing with my life? I was working, um, implementing accounts payable into large corporates and just feeling like, oh, my goodness, you know, I have a house, I have this really, you know, the job that pays me very well. It was a six figure salary. It was um, good income, but I was I was just creatively dying and wondering what the point was to my life. I mean, really, it was it was like that. And so I started to read a lot of self help books. And um, we're all British here, but the Americans do this much better. <laughs> Yeah. So I started reading a lot of American self-help books and, you know, kind of really thinking about, well, what could I do with my life? Why do I always have to do what people tell me to do? You know, I'm the eldest child of, of five, so I'm the, the responsible one, you know, the do everything the right way, get the right grades, get the proper job. And so I, um, as I was reading these self-help books, I thought, how will I put this into practice? And then I thought, I know, I'll write a book about career change. And I, I can't even remember why. I decided to write a book at that point. I think it was that I was learning so much and my natural kind of way of taking information in the world is then to write about it in a journal or um, my own journal or diary, um, you know, or if I was at work, turning things into a presentation. So I thought, oh, I'll write a a book. And so that was way back in 2006. And that was um, turned into my first nonfiction book a couple of years later. So at that point, um, you know, this was before the ebook revolution. This was before print on demand. And we can always talk about those things. But it was before being an independent author was financially viable. And at that point, I definitely did not think that I would make a living with my writing. But fast forward, and we can always go back, but fast forward, uh, 2011, I left my job. And, um, and now, yeah, 2018, I make multi six figures from my writing. So it's been a sort of a long journey. But I I think there was never that one moment of, oh, my goodness, today, I'm going to quit my job. And tomorrow, I'm going to make a living as an author. (laughs) It's just been a sort of slow process um, over, I guess, 12 years now. So going back then to 2008, I think it was, wasn't it, when you published that first non-fiction book, yeah. um, that was your first ever published book, wasn't it? So what was that initial experience like? Was it successful? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. What does success mean anyway? <laughs> I mean, I think, that, the, and this is a really important thing, you know, and actually when people... Um, you know, when I, I talk to authors, I say, you know, what is your definition of success? Because so many people think with writing, I think, you know, I know you guys do, art, you know, more uh, visual arts, but with writing, someone might spend years writing a book and then they expect that book to come out and they'll make a million and they'll retire and that'll be it. <laughs> like, it seriously is that. I don't think artists ever do that with one piece of art. But um, certainly I thought, oh, well, pu- I will get a publisher. I will um, change the world and I'll make millions, leave my job. Everything will be amazing. And um, then Tim Ferriss put out the four hour work week. <laughs> 
<laughs> just before my book came out. It, it really was a bit of a zeitgeist around then. So as you say, I put it out in 2008. But what happened was I was in Australia at the time. I did query, I think, one agent, and I just got a form rejection. And then I started learning about the publishing industry. And what I realized is that it was going to take me maybe a year to get an agent, two years, rewrites, might be two years before the book was on the shelf, might be three years. And I was like, this is crazy. What what industry works like this? You know, I was in working in, in IT. I kind of knew the speed at which you could program stuff and make it live. So I thought, well, this is this is crazy. So I at that point, I, I decided to self-publish, which in 2008, pre-Kindle, um, pre-print on demand, as I said, pre-audiobooks on pre-smartphone, actually. The iPhone came out in, um, oh, it had just come out 2007, I think it was. Um, so basically I put that book out I printed 2,000 copies and in the end it was about 1,800 copies went in the landfill <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> so oh, in terms of success, uh, let's say it was not a financial success. I definitely lost money. I got ripped off. I fell into all the traps that uh, many new authors fall into. And that's why I started my pod- my blog and my podcast, thecreativepen.com, in order to share the lessons I learned. So the success that came out of the failure, and I think this is so important, is that I learned how to write and publish a book. And I started what would become the foundation of of my um, non-fiction business, which was my blog and then my podcast. So failure, I think, if you persist and you, and also I discovered I loved writing books and to hold that book in my hand, I was, you know, I was like, I made this, this is worth more than all my years in IT, you know, this is awesome. So yeah, it was a success in so many ways, but not in the way that most people would measure it. So after that, non-fiction book in 2009 you took part in NaNoWriMo is that right the writing challenge yes and did that inspire your first novel yes so basically by 2009 so I had um at the time the book was called how to enjoy your job and I rewrote that later as career change it's it's available still as career change um but I put that book out so I had a non-fiction book I I had a podcast I had a blog I was starting to meet people and I was had a guest on the podcast this is a real challenge for podcasters I had a guest who came on and he said oh you know why don't you write a novel and I'm like I can't write fiction I I literally came out and said that I can't write fiction I'm not I'm I'm not creative I don't have an imagination you know I don't I can't make stuff up that way and he was like I think you have a block around this (laughs) and I was like you know this is on a podcast and I'm like oh okay you know really quite challenged and that was a couple of months before and then I realized that I was completely ignoring the fiction writing experience and maybe he was right. So I signed up for NaNoWriMo, which National Novel Writing Month. And I know you guys have all the challenges. It's in November. And yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, the aim is to do 50,000 words in a month, which means you have to write something like 1,200 words a day or something around that. Um, and so basically, I well, it might be 1,800. Anyway, it's it's less than... 2000 a day but you have to really go quite hard especially if you've never written a lot before because writing takes stamina so I was like okay uh gonna do this <laughs> and if people are interested I I blogged the whole experience and I did videos which is so embarrassing because back then it was you know really bad video stuff but um at thecreativepen.com forward slash first novel um and actually that tracks it from first idea to you know the book eventually years later doing really well but that NaNoWriMo I I managed 20,000 words And I was just blown, my mind was blown because I had gone from someone who had not written a story since school. Um, And suddenly I was writing, I had a character and she was having adventures and she was my alter ego, Morgan Sierra. I'm actually writing book 10 at the moment. So (laughs) that's fun. Um, And yeah, out of the 20,000 words came the seed of an idea that then I took forward and 14 months later published um, Stone of Fire. So that, and that was the first in my arcane thriller series, which is kind of Lara Croft, kind of Dan Brownish. So, did you have the idea before you actually started the writing, or did it sort of appear as you as you started writing it? I uh, had the idea of the character and the sort of agency. It's a sort of supernatural agency. Well, 
they're not supernatural they seek out supernatural mysteries around the world and I have a degree in theology so it has a lot of um, religious mythology and um, religious history so at the moment I'm kind of doing um, this book 10 is Valley of Dry Bones and it's about the Spanish Empire and um, the Spanish got everywhere <laughs> with their Catholicism um, but it, it, certainly I had the idea for the character and uh, the, it, what was quite funny is I found several years later I found in an old journal I have a lot of journals I've been writing journals since I was about 15 and I found uh, the idea that I actually wrote that book about um, in this journal and I'd forgotten that I had the idea and I know you guys appreciate appreciate this that so often with creativity we uh, you know we put stuff into our brain like you have to put stuff in fill the creative well and then you write some stuff down but then things emerge from your subconscious over time so I think you can trust emergence and trust that ideas will come um you know if people are feeling that they don't have enough ideas then a really good idea is to fill that creative well and eventually things will start emerging <laughs> so it's a bit like your journal then in, in a sense is a bit like a sketchbook is to an artist isn't it you know yeah yeah that would probably be right the sort of yeah. the things that you're not necessarily going to publish I do think it's interesting though because a lot of artists now are doing um, you know, will take photos of their sketchbooks and put them, mm. you know, on Instagram. I'm always really jealous of visual artists because you can put stuff on Instagram so easily. Whereas writers, it's just like, yeah, I'm sitting here at my computer. <laughs> and that's what my creative <laughs> process looks like. <laughs> so, you know, I do share pictures of my travels. Um, yeah. But it's, but yeah, it is. It's like a, like a sketchbook, I, I guess. So do you think that taking part in that uh, NaNoWriMo has played a big part in kickstarting your writing career? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I'll tell you why. And it's very much part of creative practice, established creative practice that anyone is going to tell you, um, which is you need to set a time for it. So you need to say, you know, like now my creative time is first thing in the morning. So I get up and there's a cafe that opens near me at 7am and I'm there at five to seven and I'm there, you know, for a couple of two and a half hours. And then I go to a yoga class or for a walk or something so that two and a half hours first thing in the morning and that's my first block and then I might do another block of creative work and then I do other work later obviously um but that that NaNoWriMo it's like you have to produce words today so when are you going to do it so you have to set your um calendar you have to make time to do this and that that is real really key the second thing is there's um it's a sort of, it is a daily practice. Now I don't write every day. So I don't, um, you know, I, I don't write new words for a new book every day, but during that month, it really kind of forced you to, to, to produce something. Now, again, I did 20,000 in a month, um, which to be fair is probably still my writing speed, <laughs> which is quite interesting <laughs> after so many books. Um, but it's, um, yeah. So I think setting that time period every day setting a kind of word count limit some people do a page limit some people do um time limit so even if you have 20 minutes then you can still get 500 words done in 20 minutes um or you can get some ideas down or you can have a think or some reading or something so that would be my what NaNoWriMo does is it kind of forces you to make time for this project uh, and so many people are like oh I'll write a book one day when I have time <laughs> And this is like, yeah, okay, so November the 1st, why don't you make the time and just say, look, this is a, one month, I'm just going to dedicate and see what happens. So I would urge people to to give it a go. I, it's funny, I haven't done it since, but because um, the timing just hasn't worked. So like this year, uh, oh, this year maybe, but, um, you know, it's kind of every time I'm starting a novel when I'm starting a, no a novel, not on the 1st of November. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a corporate job for 13 years before you actually went full-time, is that right? Yes. As being an author. So what gave you the courage to make that transition? Uh, well, <laughs> as I said, I started in 2006 and I left in 2011. So it took five years. <laughs> So, so by the time I had worked, um, I basically, again, I, uh, I'm a morning person. So, I, and I was living in Australia, so it was much easier to get up early with the sun. But I would get up around 5 a.m. I'd work 5 a.m. till 6 on my 
you know, writing stuff. And then I go to work and then I came home and uh, work on the writing stuff. Weekends, I worked on the writing stuff. And eventually I went to four days a week at my day job. So I don't think the transition for me, I guess, was not a big moment. I mean, there was a moment, obviously, when eventually I resigned, but um, I had built up the business for you know, pretty much five years, I was a professional speaker, I was making an income from my writing by the time I quit my job. Um, And it took three years to get back to where my income was. Um, You know, when I left, Um, we sold everything we downsized, or not everything, but we downsized, Uh, we sold our house. Um, So I guess we did take a big lifestyle change. But for me, the risk was staying in a job I hated and just being miserable and spending a life doing something, you know, just made me cry. So (laughs) there wasn't, I think there was much less risk. Um, You know, I prepared, we had savings, you know, I just mitigated a lot of the risk, I think. And I think you've got to sort of be happy above rich haven't you anyway to be honest do you, do yeah you know I mean? exactly like i mean i have less and and love what i do for sure yeah exactly and what's so funny of course is as i said i mean now i'm making three or four times as much as i ever made in my mm. day job and that is the secret of intellectual property um and maybe we can come back to that but the, the magic of being an author is especially an independent author is you know i control all my rights i sell in you know I've have sold books in like 86 countries and everything I put out in the world <laughs> keeps making money so it's like it's this crazy business model writing I mean with with art like like your glass um Sandra some of your glass like it's amazingly beautiful but if you sell one piece <laughs> it's gone right <laughs> That one piece is gone. So this is, um, (laughs) and I absolutely respect your art, but I I guess what I'm saying is my art's magic. (laughs) I can sell it over and over again for the rest of my life and 70 years after I die. And I think that's what's so fascinating about writing. And as I write a book, and that's why this definition of success is so important for any writers listening, because if your success is, um, I want to get a publisher and hit the Sunday Times list. Awesome. Mine was always, I want to make six figures from my writing. And my definition of success continues to be, like today I just went and lay in the park in the sun and it was just lovely. And I was just really happy. (laughs) And I wrote, oh, yesterday I did four and a half thousand words and I did a handstand at yoga. And I was like, this is the perfect day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I heard you talking about a handstand on your podcast because I listen to your podcast all the time. I love them. But um, oh, yeah, I was you. laughing about that because uh, Tara and I did this challenge, didn't we, Tara? And we made this silly, well, I made this silly video where I was standing <laughs> on my head um, and sketching. And I hadn't done a headstand probably since I was about 12. <laughs> And it, it, it just doesn't feel natural anymore. <laughs> it was amazing. It really was. Well, if you're sketching yes, at the same time, nice. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but it was quite funny. But hats off to you for doing a handstand. You've got to work your way up to a cartwheel, though. <laughs> but I don't, people don't really cartwheel in yoga. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I could just do that for fun, but it, but I think part of that part of that is you know we spend so much time well writers spend we spend so much time in our heads, and um, for me like getting more into the physical movement stuff is about like realizing I've got a body <laughs> underneath my brain, <laughs> and it well, and it's, it's you know it makes me a much healthier um, writer. It's such a static job as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Although right now I'm speaking to you from a standing desk. So that is one of my rules. If I'm podcasting, I'm standing up. So, yeah. Well, going back quickly to your making a living from this, I mean, obviously you realised very early on that you'd need to do a lot more than just write and sell books. So can you tell us about the multiple ways that you've found to do that? Yeah, sure. And I think this is uh, also a kind of time period thing. So when I I was determined to get out of my job, that was the first goal. And with the intellectual property asset thing, the money, it might be a smaller amount every month. It just keeps coming every month, but it might start out as like $10 a month and that no one can live on that, right? (laughs) But it's $10 a month and then maybe it's $100 a month and then maybe it's $100 a day and then maybe it's $1,000 a day. Um, So that might take years and years so I knew when I left 
my day job that I needed immediate cash to pay the bills. So I was doing speaking. Now, interesting enough, 10 years on, um, just coming to my 10 year anniversary as the creative pen, uh, I'm giving up speaking. So speaking has been for me a, you know, professional paid professional speaking in front of a, an audience that would that's cash in hand, basically, that is, um, you know, time money for time. So that that would be the first thing I say to people is many creatives do money for time as, um, you know, part of a day job, really, uh, speaking, consulting, coaching, serve, you know, any kind of service model where you're doing, um, you're doing a piece of work, and you're getting paid for it. But you never see any more money from that, that that's a sort of a, a freelance model, I guess. So that's been a part of my model. Um, and then everything, my whole goal has always been scalable income. So scalable is um, create something once and then you make money from it as an ongoing thing. So the the passive income idea, it's kind of a myth. I mean, you have to keep feeding these machines in some way. But the idea with like Stone of Fire, for example, that first novel, um, I think that's probably made me over 50 grand now, um, which is far more than most authors would ever get for a book. It's just been over eight years. <laughs> so that's the thing. I could earn more if I got a, a speaking gig just, you know, straight away, but I'll earn more over time by creating intellectual property assets. So that's that's the balance you need. Um, so in terms of my other streams of income, I have courses, which again, I'm trying to make them evergreen. This is a real lesson learned. <laughs> if you do anything based on stuff that will change, you're going to have to update it um, over time. So try and think about evergreen courses, uh, you know, things like uh, design or well, graphic design, for example, Tara, you know, the software will change. So if you do a tutorial on the software way to do this, then that's going to change. You have to re-record a video. Whereas if you do something on the elements of color, that might not change. So, so I have books, I have courses, I have did have speaking. I have affiliate income. So that is uh, selling other people's courses and services. So for example, editors, I refer quite a lot of editors, I have tutorials for website building and stuff like that. Um, but that is again, based on traffic. So it's scalable. So I create it once. And then depending on how many people buy it or click a link or, you know, view it on YouTube, then I get more money. So that was always the design. It was, it has to be scalable. How can I build a scalable business where I do something once and it just keeps delivering for years and years? Um, and that is the only way as a creative professional or any professional, if you have a business like me, where you don't want employees, <laughs> like I'm not building um, you know, I'm not building a massive company with loads of headcount. It's just me and now my husband. Um, you know, that's the only way to do it. You have to have scalable income and then you don't have to keep working. <laughs> Even though I love working and I will keep working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can, can I just amazing. ask what made you um, give up your speaking? Um, well, it's mainly that when it comes down to it, you have to look at what uh, brings you joy and energy <laughs> in your life and I'm an introvert I like being on my own a lot I find uh, I'm not shy so you know if we met in person I'm all as I am now I'm, I'm not a shy person but I'm an introvert which means I get um, very tired um, de-energized by people so when I'm speaking I will give everything. I have not ever learned the way to conserve my energy in a room full of people. So I've spoken, you know, to like a thousand people and I'll come out, I'll come away from that feeling like I have just given myself to a thousand people and then we'll spend three days in bed <laughs> shaking. <laughs> so, so essentially I either have to learn how to deal with my energy and have to go back and do a lot of training around energy management to be a speaker or I have to just admit that I'm a writer <laughs> And I'm, and I, the thing is, again, I, I love writing the joy of podcasting, as you guys know, like right now, we don't even know how many people are going to listen to this. And we're doing, I'm in this room on my own. I'm talking to you guys. Um, and I'm not going to be as exhausted as I would be if we were doing this live in front of a 
load of people. <laughs> so it, I think that's that's mainly it, is that I, um, I, I want to spend my energy on other things. I want to travel for book research rather than um, speaking. And also I want to go to events as a learner. So I'm now looking to go to other things that, you know, previously I would have spoken at things and now I'm going to different things as uh, one of the crowd as such. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I just want to go back to you saying that how much you love writing. So out of nonfiction and fiction, do you prefer writing one or the other? Uh, it's been, I, I think there are two, uh, two parts of me. I think, um, Sandra, I was looking on your website and you mentioned having a bright colour side and then a darker side. Um, oh, and, yeah. yeah, and that's basically how I am too. So Joanna Penn is, um, you know, the self-help. <laughs> So, so my aim, my aim very early on was to kind of be like a British Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield, who are speakers. And I mean, I am nowhere near Tony Robbins. I mean, he is, uh, you know, the top of his game in terms of speaking. Um, but in terms of helping people, so the that side of me, Joanna Penn, writing nonfiction is all about helping other people with their creative life. Um, but then I would be no good at that unless I was looking after the darker side of me, JF Penn, which um, is not happy unless she's writing, you know, making up stories. And kind of, I realise now looking back that I had all the hallmarks of a fiction writer. I was, I, I said to a friend of mine, I just don't remember that those people from university. And she's like, that's because you never paid attention to anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, right, okay. So I was just in my head and I was reading a lot, you know. So I think uh, I, I can't choose one or the other. What I will say is that I've made a decision now for the next 18 months to only write fiction, but I'm still serving my nonfiction audience with the podcast and my blog. So I also, you know, this is a good thing to talk about with you guys, actually. I, I always found the podcast... Um, originally it was meant to be marketing under the marketing bracket but now it's actually its own thing I mean it does make money I should have said that earlier the podcast makes money through Patreon and um, advertising but it's also a way to serve an audience who might not read your books and that is gold dust and also it's a regular thing like I write a book and it's out of you know a non-fiction book it might be out of date but uh, as a weekly podcaster I get to share what I'm learning every single week and so I think podcasting itself can change people's lives. It can be a self-help kind of instrument itself and as part of our body of work. I mean, you definitely meet loads of people that way as well, don't you? Connect with all different people. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's great. I mean, you guys must enjoy it too. Yeah, I, think, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves, haven't we, Tara, as well? Um, and talking to people like you, some things that people say, you kind of... Um, something clicks and you think yes that's happening to me right now and you it is like therapy in a way sometimes yeah and, uh, well yeah, I, I mean I, I primarily invite people on my show who I want to yeah. learn from <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. well we learn a lot don't we Tara it's amazing and we absolutely love it it's great to sort of talk to other like-minded people and, and find your tribe I suppose mm, and help your tribe as well yeah Absolutely. There's just one thing I want to ask you about your um, fiction and your non-fiction. You mentioned that you write one lot under Joanna Penn and one load with JF Penn. Why is that? Uh, a, f a few reasons. Um, I mean, I, I, start, I wrote the first two novels under Joanna Penn and then I really realised that it was a very different side of me. I think with the, you know, finding your voice, in inverted commas, that, you know, people talk about with writing fiction you realize that that there's this other side of you. And so the first thing was to separate my websites and my audience. And it really became obvious in that way that I needed a different um, label as such, a different brand to put myself under. So that was the first reason it was to really separate myself. Second thing is um, big data and algorithms, which many, you know, we know rule the world now. And on uh, websites like Amazon, on iBooks, on all these, you know, Kobo, um, they group together, you know, people who bought this also bought that. And you'll get an automated email from Amazon saying, hey, do you want to try this? Or, you know, on your Kindle, it might say, you know, you've bought this, you might like these books. So if you mess up your also boughts, um, you know, people who buy my book on how to write nonfiction, then getting served ads for my, for my thrillers, 
they might not click on it and it'll impact my algorithms basically. So this is a really good reason why people writing in different markets should have different names. Um, so that they were, those are the primary reasons, um, really the separating the branding. And I'm so glad I did. It's very hard to maintain multiple brands, but I'm so glad I did because they really are two different audiences, two different personas. Um, yeah, completely different. Can I just ask, because obviously we spoke earlier about you, you having to do so much to, to be able to be a success, you know, research, marketing, blogging. Obviously, you carve out specific times to write. Do you ever find that you're just not in the right headspace, though? Obviously, with all of that going on, you must presumably have quite a strict schedule that you follow in, in order to keep up with everything. Yeah, so, well, on the headspace thing, I, I kind of, uh, I'm... A professional writer making a living with my writing so this is yeah. my job and not a hobby and so it's like any job it you don't say oh I just don't feel like it today um I'll just not do it uh you know the and Stephen King in on writing which is you know every writer should read on writing <laughs> I mean he says you know you have to be in the same place every day and the muse the muse doesn't come when you summon it the muse will needs to get to know where you where you are at what time and eventually you might show up um in the meantime just do the work and you know what's so fascinating with writing I don't know whether it's the same with other art is it doesn't matter what mood I'm in. Some days it comes really hard. You know, like I said yesterday, I did four and a half thousand words in a handstand. And those four and a half thousand words came so easy. They were smooth and I would just, you know, and then another day I might be sitting there. And I mean, today I did about 900 words in the same amount of time. And it was hard. But I won't be able to tell, you won't be able to tell if you read that book, what was written in the, in quotation marks, flow and what was hard graft. You won't be able to tell because, you know, they're, <laughs> they're just words on a page <laughs> making up a story. Um, so that would be my first thing uh, is, you know, if you're going to do this, then take it seriously. And the other thing about the organizing is I kind of have two schedules. So when I am writing a book, so I'm writing Valley of Dry Bones right now, the 10th book in the Arcane Thriller series. And so I'm writing a first draft. And when I'm writing first draft, it's every day in the week, so five days a week. Um, so, and I will do my blocks. So I'll do between two and four hours of actual writing every day and until it's done. And then the editing phase is slightly different, but I'll still have that time carved out. But the um, research phase, so like last month, we were in Madrid and Toledo, and then we went to uh, Mallorca um, and Palma, and I, don't know, I was in New Orleans and San Francisco. And I mean, that time is completely separate. So I have the filling the creative well time when I just don't write, I take pictures. Uh, and then when I'm in my first draft phase, I have a really boring schedule, which is you know, get up at the same time, go to the cafe, eat the same food, go to yoga, <laughs> get back to the desk. Um, and to me, you, I, if I'm too stimulated by like, I can't write when I'm traveling, just can't because <laughs> I'm so stimulated. Whereas when I have my routine, that's when my brain can be like, okay, just focus on the story, you know, just, just do it. Um, and I should say my number one tool for organization is Google Calendar on my phone and I just schedule those time blocks and then I keep them he's so organized <laughs> yeah well I, I think I was. I've always been an organized person and I know you know I don't know if you can change that in terms of your personality like some people listening might just find that ridiculous <laughs> so you have to do whatever the best you can but that's what's so funny I mean you guys know as well there are artists of every personality type it does not matter how you get to the finished product but there has to be a finished product if you're serious about this so you said that first book that you printed you printed those 2,000 copies but the next book you still decided to self-publish so why did you carry on going that route and I know are you pleased you you went that way yeah, well, I'm still, I, I say I'm an independent author now. I, I 
don't really like the term self-publishing because I work with about 11 different freelancers. So I work with several different freelance editors, um, freelance cover designers, um, you know, so basically I have an audio guy for the podcast. And so I, I pay a load of professionals. I run a, I have my own publishing press, Curlot Press. Um, I, you know, license my rights. Um, I run a publishing business, just happens that <laughs> my books are the books that it publishes. Um, but why I continued is mainly the revolution that happened just after I did that first book. So um, it was just, it was 2009, I think, when the international Kindle launched. And that changed my life because I, as such a massive reader living in Australia, you guys wouldn't even realize this, but in Britain, our books are so cheap. In Australia, I was paying maybe six times the price of a book in the UK paperback. So as, as a book addict, you know, in, uh, and I would, I, I read probably, you know, three to five books a week. Um, I was, I was breaking the bank on new books in Australia. You know, I really was, it was just my, my hobby was costing me loads. And then ebooks, arrive and I was I was got the first international Kindle on pre-order and when it arrived it was like oh my goodness this is going to change the world and then they announced that they were offering 70 percent 70 percent uh to authors and I had found out from my publishing you know investigations that most authors were getting seven percent to up to now some are getting 25 percent but most authors you know seven to 15 percent and so I, I was gonna get you know eight to ten times the amount of money and so I just could not see why I wouldn't do that um I'm you know I am a businesswoman and um I did have a goal I did have an income goal and getting out of my job goal I I never had a goal of winning a prize I mean, now I kind of do and I am award nominated now and I would like to win a prize. But um, at the time it was like, what, you know, why would I give 90 percent of the money to a publisher? And that's what I think authors get wrong. They think, oh, the publisher's going to pay me five grand, which is the average advance in the UK. Uh, a lot of it is a lot lower. Um well, it might be the median, I'm not sure about, you know, the average and the median, but it, it, that's a common figure. Um, and then, and I don't know if you, you guys have seen recently in The Guardian, they reported the average income for a UK author is £10,500 per year. I heard you say that on yeah, your last yeah, episode. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like, sorry, but no, no, thank you. <laughs> so, and again, it's about who who are your role models? You know, I am an artist, but I am an artist who enjoys a really good life. So my, my goal is Picasso <laughs> rather than like Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the mental health, but just look at their bank balances. Picasso died worth hundreds of millions of, of dollars. And he was incredibly prolific. I think he, wasn't it? He created something like 50,000 pieces of work over his life of all different kinds. And he didn't wait around for anyone to say, oh, you're great. He just got on with it and put his stuff out there. He was a hustler. He, you know, marketed like a, like a genius and lived and really lived. Um, so he's kind of more my model. Um, so that makes sense. It's about it's about taking control of your own creative destiny and not waiting for anyone else to pick you. Um, it's about speed. It's about yeah, control, speed, income, uh, and empowerment. I think it's the empowerment of the creative in a world where we can sell direct. Um, why why wouldn't we? I guess. Can I just ask if you've ever had writer's block? Is this something you've ever experienced? And if you have, how did you get over it? I can't imagine you have somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, again, it's, um, and I, I wrote about this in The Successful Author Mindset, which is a book all about, you know, the mental health side of writing. And I yeah. personally don't, uh, well, I mean, maybe I had writer's block right at the beginning when, as I said, um, in that podcast, uh, uh, Tom, the guy I was interviewing, said, you've got a block around this. I didn't see it as a block, and then suddenly I did. But um, writer's block normally comes from a couple of things. It's not filling the creative well. It, it, it's sitting down when you haven't filled your mind, when you're not a reader, when you're not going out into the world and bringing back ideas. So that's one block. Second block is saggy middle, which is classic with writers. They're all like, oh, I'm so excited about this idea. They write 10,000 words, and then they're bored. <laughs> 
<laughs> like I'm so bored and it's like yeah yeah so you don't know how to write a book <laughs> you actually need to learn how to write a book um and then uh, many people are blocked at the end because they're scared of finishing. They are scared of putting their voice in the world. So there are lots of reasons why people might be blocked. Um, personally, no, I'm one of the camp who don't believe in writer's block itself. I, I think that there are always ways you can you can deal with it. And those are the, the three most common, really. And I think it's, it's more of a psychological thing anyway, I think, blocks, especially with artists, um, presumably with writers as well. I think there's something, it goes a bit deeper somehow than just not knowing what to write or not knowing what to paint. Yeah, it's often fear, it, fear of failure. It's a huge one, fear of judgment. And um, fear of success as well, I think, sometimes Yeah, too. So, sometimes, yeah. I do think, I, I think that fear of success is actually fear of judgment because if you're successful, then you're going to be you know, you're going to be out there and people are going to attack you. And we know that in this market, yeah. we know that the most successful artists get attacked. So, you know, it's that fear of being seen, fear of, you know, fear of just, yeah, people not liking you <laughs> and yeah. just being out there. And I mean, it is scary, right? Um, but you have to be able to put that behind you. I mean, all of us get, I mean, I, I get nasty emails and things like just like anyone else but you have to go well what would I rather be doing <laughs> do you just want to shrink and not put yourself out there or or take the tiny tiny point naught 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 one percent who are mean and but most of the community is just amazing that's why I love and my I, podcast too the community yeah. is brilliant I always think it says more about the other person anyway when they write mean comments. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't feel like... I mean, I do... I have a virtual assistant as well, which is really useful. In fact, I told this to another lady the other day. She was like, oh, I'm just getting these comments and things. And I'm like, get a virtual assistant and then send your primary email through that other person and then they never get to you. And that's really that's important because it's like blocking... You know, when you get spam calls on your phone, you just block things I just get so many of them it's so annoying um and it's the same you if you don't see it then it doesn't bother you um but all of us we're human you know we do get upset by things so for me it's all about um curating and blocking and putting things in the way of it just totally derailing me <laughs> and understanding that none of us can please everyone anyway yeah can we? exactly yeah so what do you think has been the highlight of your creative journey so far well, again, I think this comes back to definition of success. Um, some people would say that there have been highlights. Oh, you know, I, but it's more that I've had goals and then I've met my goals. But, you know, because I'm um, maybe a part of being creative is creative dissatisfaction. So I'm very grateful for where I am. You know, I'm very grateful that I'm able to make such a great living with my writing, but I'm really focused on this next book. And, you know, I'm I'm thinking ahead to the research trips I'm going to do for the next book. And um, so for me, the highlights, you know, even things like hitting the New York Times was, I found, sad to say, disappointing. <laughs> I've hit the USA Today list twice. Again, it's a game. Like you realize when you get into this, it's a game. You play the game you know, you, you can, you can achieve things that people said were highlights and they don't necessarily feel like highlights. Like I've had a New York agent and I celebrated and then we split up, uh, six months later. Um, so I, I really think that the whole point of this, and if people read uh, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield or his book, Turning Pro, which I reread all the time, <laughs> it's so, so good. It's more that it's the daily practice that is the point. And he, he quotes Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, you are entitled to your labor, not the fruits of your labor. And that, is, that might sound hard work in many ways, but the point is, I'm living this life because I was miserable in my day job. And when, like today, or like yesterday really was a real perfect day. Like I said, I'd had two great writing sessions. I wrote four and a half thousand words on my new book and I did a handstand and I had dinner with my husband and it's sunny and you know seriously like that's the highlight <laughs> it's being able to do this and write the things I want to write and travel and help people and yeah so it's really the daily the daily things are are the highlight 
So where can people sort of find out a bit more about you, Joanna? Because you, you're in multiple places across the internet, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Well, um, for the writing side, thecreativepen.com, and that's pen with a double N. And you'll find my free author blueprint and video, free video stuff there. And I have a YouTube channel, The Creative Pen, and the podcast, The Creative Pen. And I'm on Twitter at The Creative Pen. And my um, fiction is JF Pen, J.F. Pen, um, in, in all the usual places and available in ebook print and audiobook uh yeah all, all over the place so that that's probably what where people can find me well, thank you ever so much it's been lovely talking to you yeah you you've been absolutely fantastic it's been a real joy to to hear your story and um yeah good luck with your next um series of books <laughs> thanks so much for having me it's been great fun take care then okay, bye 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 Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes. Back soon.